We know that the transatlantic slave trade was made illegal in 1808. From 1808 until the eve of the, of the Civil War, there had been this steady influx of African influence through these smuggled captives. I think this is one of the reasons why the Wanderer is so important. One of the things about The Wanderer that makes it so remarkable is that this is a, a moment in time that we can document. Here's one point where we really can say something about where people came from and how they might have tried to recreate aspects of their cultural history, their cultural heritage in this new environment. What's interesting about this Wanderer project is, is the brazenness of what Charles Lamar was doing. He actually had been advertising that he was going to reopen the slave trade. He said, the government can catch me if they can, because I'm going to get this fast ship. And so it was a brazenness that I'm going to openly do this. It wasn't as secret as you know, we kind of originally believed. Charles Lamar knew that the U.S. Marshals were made aware of what had just transpired, so he was very quick to get rid of any evidence of his misdoings. So he sent many off onto barges to Alabama, onto trains to uh, Texas, and had placed um, almost 200 on the steamboat Augusta, which came up the Savannah along Horse Creek and delivered many of them to his cousin's Woodlawn Plantation. After arriving, they were sent to plantations uh, along Edgefield County to the Blands. And Sophia Tillman, the mother of uh, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, had acquired 30 of them without paying for them, which infuriated Lamar. Undoubtedly, Davies had some of these wanderer slaves as proven by records that exist. The style of face jug that was made at Colonel Thomas Davies' pottery had never been seen before at any of the other potteries in this area. They did work in the potteries. The pots did start to turn up at this time frame then there was no other logical connection but the Wanderer. We've been able to connect the practice of making face jugs and the uh, kale and clay to West African traditions. And so these are people that were stripped from their country and, and stripped of everything, but they have what their practices were in their minds. In Congo, you find this incredibly uh, robust and um, diverse system of ritual objects which we call Minkisi. Minkisi is a, a container into which um, one puts certain spiritual or ritual medicines, and that Minkisi, that ritual object, is used to communicate between the living and the dead, between this world and the next world. And I think when we're talking about face vessels as well, that one of the necessary actions that, that the, the object does is that it must spark this sense of, scholars call it um, power and astonishment that it must evoke this sense of astonishment, that the, the vessel itself must carry a kind of power in its own physicality, also in, in its own appearance, that it has to look like something that's otherworldly. It started with the jug. Africans who created it believed that it had a power that was imbued when they introduced the kaolin to the vessel. And because it was so close 
to the end of uh, slavery, those people were able to, to uh, maintain their memories of their homeland and their African names. Uh, there's usually a systematic, uh, you know, erasing of your memory of Africa once you land. And one of the first things is to change your name. And then the second thing is to repress telling stories to uh, future generations. But the Wanderer landed in 1858, and within two years, South Carolina was seceding from the Union. And so it was about two and a half years the Civil War started, and when it ended, these newly arrived Africans were free, and their memories were still intact of their homeland. That's what's so incredible about the Wanderer story. When you understand that stories choose you, which is something that I understood, you know, I had my great-grandmother that was in my life for 20 years, and she was the daughter of emancipated slaves. And when she retired, uh, she began to take this toddler around and teach him about his history. And she taught me that we had to relate our stories orally because it was against the law to teach um, a slave to read and write. And she taught me how to, to look through all oral history, all stories, and find the golden thread of truth that runs through all of them. And so when I started to speak to April, I actually uh, saw the golden thread in her story. My name is April Hines. I'm from Philadelphia. My family and I live in Washington Crossing, PA. We have three beautiful children and have been in the area most of all of our lives. It's hard to explain what I do. I'm like, just looking at you going, is this what Dave looked like? We've never seen his face. Yes, I've wondered about that for many years. Yeah. It's something you can't capture in one sentence. Often I say, well, I, I'm telling a story about the last slave ship to come to Georgia and how a face jug took me on a journey. And most people reply with the question, what's a face jug? My grandfather, my ancestor, gave me this face jug. My grandfather, Scotty, uh, Robert Strang, was born in Scotland and he came over to the United States with his mother and his family around 1923. One day on a job, which often I heard very much about and how all the curious objects that he would unearth in the ground. But this one was very special because when he was digging for what I believe was probably a, a, a trench for piping, probably around 1950, 1952, his shovel curiously clanked against something and he reached down and pulled it up out of the ground, turned it around and here was this face glaring back at him and not having any idea what on earth it was, he showed it to his foreman and a couple of his guys and they said, oh, maybe it's a piece of Indian pottery. It might be worth something. Just take it home, Scotty. So he did and so he brought it back to their house in Germantown, Philadelphia, which was only a few blocks, if not a block away, from where he was working that day and shocked everyone in the family who all seemed to have that interest the minute you see this face and asked what it, what it was. And it landed on the Rustin radiator next to the fireplace and remained there for many, many years. No one knew what it was. Thankfully, my grandfather felt it was important and he, he had the, the insight to, to keep it and to preserve it. The face jug was, it actually found her. Her grandfather dug it up, but it wasn't for him to tell the story. His job was to uncover the jug and ho actually hold it until April was old enough because it was her story that she was going to tell it. This jug began to react to uh, April in a way that it did not react to anyone else. I had my face jug placed in my china closet, which was the front room of our house. It was the first thing I would see every time I came in. One day I went over to the jug and I'm looking at it, I'm staring at it, I'm thinking about who were they, who made this jug? I felt this deep connection with the people that made it, the hands that turned it. So much so, I said, I gotta name this jug. And I said, well, maybe I'll name it Dave, once I learned about Dave, uh, the famous uh, enslaved potter. So I said, Miles Lewis, 
How about we name it Lewis? It had a name, and again, every time I would go by it, I would have to come to it, and I'd have to listen to it. And I would almost hear, find us, tell our stories, find us, tell our stories. And it was so powerful that I actually made a promise to the jug that I'm going to try to find your person, whether it was the person who's, who made it, the person who brought it up north. I had gone down to the Philadelphia archives with a friend and began to peel through every uh, piece of information that I had on the property location. And it wasn't until I came across one of the censuses that um, listed two African Americans that lived at the house. One was the chauffeur and one was the private cook. They were listed on the census of being born in South Carolina. I quickly typed on Ancestry.com, you know, looking for this man's uh, draft card to figure out where he was born. And here he was born in Edgefield, South Carolina. And when I scrolled up the document to look at his name, he was a garden hire, and then his first name was Lewis. After I found Lewis Garden Hire on the census, it was an instant gift. I was kind of working backwards and putting together a tree to figure out what his, who his ancestors were. They also led me back to Germantown, Philadelphia. So I opened up the phone book, hoping that the apple didn't fall far from the tree, and chose a garden hire in the middle of the phone book and placed a call and I was connected to Lewis Garden Hire's niece. And she told me about the family coming from Edgefield, how they, Lewis was the son of a slave named William and Louisa. On a hunch, I had thought to look at the Davies records, who was the first person to connect slaves making face jugs. I went back through his slave records, and there, to my amazement, I saw connections like his grandparents and William and Louisa, his parents, and his Alec and, and all the names in his family were there. I met April a few years ago. That she was tracing this owner whose name was Louis Gardenhire. Um, I'm a member of the Gardenhire family, and so I was asked to come in. I'm also a historian to, you know, to assist her in any way that I could. When we met in the HBO archives, I was flipping through a notebook full of uh, information that I had, and I came across a, a sheet from a newsletter that was entitled, uh, Africans Born in Africa. And as I looked at this one particular sheet, it came to me that April's story was actually not about searching for this one family, but it was about searching for this larger story, which was survivors of the slave ship Wanderer. But what I did is I gave her that sheet and I gave her a card of a gentleman to call. And I thought that when she left, I believed that she would find her own way into the Wanderer story. And, and she did. My great grandmother, the same one, taught me all these stories and taught me how to f follow the golden thread. She would go and visit. That's what seniors did back then. We we're going to go out and visit. She would always take this little child with her, it was just me. And, and I go to Seppi's house, where they call her Seppi. And uh, she'd give me milk and cookies, and I'd just sit down and listen to them tell all these you know, stories. Uh, she was born in Charleston in 1898, and she was one of my grandmother's uh, friends. Uh, my grandmother was born in 1895, so they kind of knew each other most of their life. But they both went into the teaching profession, taught on the Sea Islands. But Seppi McClark was actually fired for her uh, civil rights activities. She ended up taking a post in the Highland Folk School in Tennessee, training uh, civil rights workers and, and people who were uh, planning strikes and things of that nature. And it just so happens that uh, in, in 1955, Rosa Parks came to take Septa McClark's workshop. Rosa was so uh, overwhelmed, and she, as she says, I'm in awe of Septa McClark because she had been doing things 40 years prior to us even getting into this thing. And Septa McClark actually inspired her. 
people in the civil rights movement consider Septima the grandmother of the civil rights movement. They consider Rosa Parks the mother of Septima Clark, the grandmother. And Septima Clark actually inspired her to go back to Montgomery, Alabama and voluntarily go and sit on that bus and, and get arrested. So she became a close advisor to Martin Luther King Jr. When he went to accept his Nobel Peace Prize, he took Septima Clark with him, said she deserves it as much as I do. But this uh, remarkable woman is a child of one of the survivors of the slave ship wanderer, as Peter points said. What about your father's background? Well, my father, I understand, came over on the ship wanderer to some part of Georgia. Slaves were portioned out in many parts of South Carolina <laughs> and Georgia. What's interesting about this wanderer project is, is the brazenness of what Charles Lamar was doing. And what he did is he ends, ended up transporting these seeds from Africa into the United States of America. And then you have a descendant that actually is one of the champions of freedom fighting that comes from somebody that was one of the last slaves to enter the uh, country. In 1908, Charles Montgomery, an anthropologist, interviewed the seven Africans on the Tillman Plantation in Edgefield County. He was interviewing them, their memories of being stolen from Africa, what their African names were, like Sulu Kanji, Pukagita, Taro, Manchuela, had all been accorded to each picture that he photographed. And for the first time, you get to see their stories and, and hear their stories. And that was really the first time uh, I was able to get a glimpse of the Wanderer Africans. My name is Fred Morton. I am the great, great grandson of Yango. His American name was given to him was Thomas Lanham. And about five years ago, uh, a friend, a mutual friend of ours, uh, introduced April. Where that was the connection between myself being a wanderer, descendant, and the project that April was working on. Church history, that's my, my forte. It began to connect the community, uh, the families that were associated with the wanderer, families that I've known all my life. Now I realize that. We're, we're even so much more of a, a family proper because the folk who lived on the next farm over, I realized that their uh, great-great-grandmother was also on the Wanderer, and we didn't know that connection before April. When I went to Jekyll Island, it was a profound moment for me. If you felt the presence, you could feel the distance from America to Africa. You could look out with the ocean, the whole gap there. It, it, it was amazing standing there. I took my shoes off and I stood barefoot on the same beach where they land. It really, really was a, a moving moment for me. One of the stories that I discovered was about the landing of the slave ship, the Wanderer. The Africans were brought upon the shores of Henry Dubignon's plantation. There was fires set out and people were huddling and eating out of a mess kettle. And one of the Africans who was the slave of Henry Dubignon had come out and he was a native African that must have been brought over before the slave trade was abolished. He was able to communicate with the slaves and so he was placed in charge of being able to be an interpreter. And while doing so, he came closer to a fire which lit up his face that had three tribal slashes along the side. And people around the fire began to shout out his name, Payimba, Payimba. And here, he was their leader back in Africa. And 50 years later, after their separation, this event reunited them, and he was able to bring some sort of peace and solace to a very tragic situation. 
my family, uh, we didn't have a face jug and I wanted to fashion something to tell the story. I wanted to put the dates on it that the ship arrived and wanted the notches to represent important dates uh, when we took the trip to Jekyll Island. Right on the shore, there was a, a, a cedar tree that had fallen over and the water had washed it, uh, all the dirt and everything off of it. So I got this whole cedar tree, <laughs> the whole branch of it, and it was a seven foot long. I had it in my minivan driving it back. And I, I saw it and used carving and there's all kinds of paint and clay and all kinds of mixed media. But I wanted to definitely come up with something that would express the, the, the Lanham's connection. I am Patricia Bishop. I am the daughter of O.C. Barnes, who is the granddaughter of um, Silikonji, or Wardley as he later chose his name to be. He was um, very young and he was um, brought to this country on the Wanderer and was brought to Jekyll Island. And from Jekyll Island, he came to Edgefield and lived uh, in Senator Tillman's plantation. Now, from what my aunts tell me, he didn't do a lot of field work. What he actually did, because he was young, um, on the ship, he listened to a lot of the dialects and was able to discern and interpret dialects and speak to other Africans on the ship. And that's, that's ooh, it's a real spiritual voyage, voyage for me when I think about it. But the Africans, the slaves would sing and talk to each other while they were chained on the ship. Ward Lee learned um, many of the languages. He also built a, a straw hut, and that hut was built with uh, Romeo and Tucker. When they did have time, they took this hut to Columbia. And the purpose for going to Columbia was to try to glean monies to get back to Africa, which was his one goal was to get back to Africa. And we do have a letter from Woodley that he actually wrote and somebody um, interpreted for him. To the public, please help me. One year ago, it was revealed to me to go home back to Africa. In 1859, I was brought to this country when I was a child. I cannot say just what age I was then, but I have been aroused by the spirit, and I trust it was the spirit of God. I am bound by my old home. If God be with me, white or black, yellow or the red, I am an old African. He never made it back to Africa. He encouraged his grandchildren to, um, to be educated and to be landowners. So he passed that down to us from, um, from slavery. We have actual proof of him voting. He's actually logged in Edgefield and voted. That encourages us to vote. I believe that would have been a dream come true for him to see all of us vote including my mom who votes, and to see us elect a president into um, the United States. On this day, we gather because we have chosen hope over fear. You think, excuse me, but, you know, I, you know, I think about this often, and I talk to my children about it, about the sacrifice is so many. So many of our people went through, you know, just to be have the right to vote, you know, just to do, you know, pretty much do, you know, anything and look for equality. It's when you you know the history and you start to, to look at the conditions that that our ancestors went through and they made it and they survived and they still were able to celebrate and they were still able to have families and they were still able to move forward and make it just a little better for the next generation and they just keep moving forward to the point where you have, have 
Barack Obama has a chance to be a president. And so when you, you know you go into the booth and you think about it, you know they deserve to be there too. They deserve to be there because it was their work that that, that gave them the opportunity to do that. And, and of course, it opened up for for future generations and so forth. But somebody's got to you know lay it on the line, and and they did, and they did. Um, we do know uh, uh, through the oral history of Ward Lee's family that he made a face jug um, and that he worked in the potteries. We also see uh, Romeo Thomas, um, who was in this picture, um, who appeared on the Thomas D J. Davies slave records at least three times. So these are the types of things that are connecting with people as well as tradition. I know Lee's who held this jug so close to her. The face on it almost looks like him when I look at it. It's a very African face. And she said that he made it and he gave it to her dad and then it was handed down to her. She held onto this jug until 1992 when Michael was married and gave it to him in New York as a wedding gift. My grandmother gave it to me and told me to hold it and keep it. Amen for grandparents. Yeah, yeah. Grandmothers are wonderful. Yeah. And this is the one that's an issue? Uh, yeah, well, she passed away. She, she, I'll say uh, this one that was an issue. Yes, issue. yes, ma'am. It certainly has changed my life. It has taken me on a remarkable journey one that I could never have imagined. This power behind these objects, I, I can say firsthand that I've experienced, that it had a message. This magic behind these jugs, this power, was seen so amazingly because here, just like the Bible verse said, we're like jars of clay. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. I had learned that my jug was placed in the ground. It was hard pressed by its, its being buried, but it was miraculously not crushed. And the jug had people behind it that were persecuted but not forgotten. And this Wanderer Project, this story, embodies all of these things. I know where they are, right here. It was a gift of understanding that we're all part of a bigger family. We're all each other's family. I've often thought about the person that sat at that Turner's wheel. Did he know that this face jug was going to go off? Did he send it off with a, a sailing mission to bring back all of the forgotten ancestors on the slave ship wander? Because that's what it did. It brought and restored what was stolen. <laughs>